I'm Maria Rosario Jackson, Chair of the National Endowment for the Arts. I have dark hair. I'm wearing a black top with a gold colored necklace. I'm sitting in front of a white background with the NEA logo in the corner. Welcome to the members of the National Council on the Arts, arts leaders, NEA staff, and members of the public. It is a great honor to serve as chair of the NEA and to be with you today. I'm especially delighted to welcome our newest members of council who were confirmed and sworn in this spring. Several are experiencing their first council meeting today. For the record, National Council on the Arts members joining us our, uh, for today, our nonprofit executive director, Ishmael Ahmed of Michigan, clarinetist and composer, Keenan Azme of New York, attorney, Vita Becker of California, arts researcher, Bruce Carter of Florida, State Arts Agency Chair Gretchen Davidson of Michigan, Arts Administrator Maria de Leon of Texas, Director Producer Camila Forbes of New York, Attorney, Musician, and former con Congress member Paul Holds of Maine, Author, Editor, Poet Huascar Medina of Kansas, Choreographer, Educator, Arts Administrator Christopher Morgan of Hawaii, Record Label Foundation President Fiona Prine of Tennessee, dancer, choreographer, teacher Rani Ramaswamy of, Mich of Minnesota, ukulele musician Jake Shimabukuro of Hawaii, and entrepreneur consultant uh, Connie Williams of Pennsylvania. Welcome, everyone. So uh, just as a way of uh, offering some background, um, the NEA was signed into law by President Lyndon Baines Johnson in 1965. It is an independent federal agency that works to help provide our country with opportunities to participate in and experience the arts. The Arts Endowment is the only funder, public or private, that provides access to the arts in all 50 states, the District of Columbia and the U.S. territories. By advancing equitable opportunities for arts participation and practice, the NEA fosters and sustains an environment in which the arts benefit everyone in the United States. The NEA has awarded $5.6 billion since its inception, supporting things such as performances, exhibitions, healing arts and arts education programs, festivals, artist residencies, arts and design-based community development, and a wide range of research that helps us better understand different facets of cultural life and the contributions of arts and culture in our society. Before I was a council member, I wasn't fully aware of the reach and breadth of the history and daily impact of the Arts Endowment. For example, the NEA is the only federal agency to win an Oscar and a Tony. Uh, with the support of the NEA, the Sundance Film Festival was launched. Through its work with the Department of Defense and Veteran, Veterans Affairs, as well as other partners, the NEA has been involved in pioneering work at the intersection of arts and health. Since 1986, the Arts Endowment has supported mayors in design solutions around pressing issues. The Arts Endowment also supports design solutions in rural communities through the Citizens Institute on Rural Design. And most recently, the NEA has helped to better understand the impacts of the pandemic on the cultural sector and it is working to create the platforms where we can learn from our examined experience. Well, for many, the NEA is primarily understood as an important source of grants or financial support, which it absolutely is. I think it's also critically important to understand its role as a convener, connector, catalyst, provider of information and research, as well as a thought partner and thought leader. In the next few minutes, I'll share some reflections with you about the evolution of the Arts Endowment and insights from recent travel around the country and priorities out of my office. 
The wide range of ways in which the NEA can and does assert as a national resource on arts, culture, and design for the country continues to inspire me. While for many folks, the NEA is understood as the grant maker, um, I'm excited in uh, advancing our work in helping the sector to recover and evolve as we move through the pandemic and am optimistic about what is possible if we commit to not just snapping back to nostalgic versions of the sector pre-pandemic. Uh, it's important that we learn from our examined experience and emerge stronger, more strategic, and better equipped to truly meet mission. To help build and strengthen arts and cultural ecosystems, to promote and make possible artful lives for all people, and to strengthen essential work at the intersection of arts and other areas such as health, education, and community development. And certainly we do this and will continue to do this through our important grant making programs and through other functions as well. Since becoming chair, I've had the opportunity to travel to communities across the country and visit NEA grantees, learn about the impacts of the American Rescue Plan and the CARES Act, and meet with leaders of the arts sector, as well as others who want to partner with us. Recent travels have included visits to San Francisco, Oakland, Boston, uh, Minneapolis, Chicago, St. Paul, Baltimore, Reno for the US Conference of Mayors quite recently, and San Diego to celebrate the anniversary of Blue Star Museums with military families. Travel to Alabama, New York, Alaska, Idaho, Oregon, and Maine are on my horizon in the near future. And as I meet people around the country and learn more about what is needed and what is possible in different kinds of communities, our work here at the Arts Endowment is further informed and refined. So informed by these experiences and internal explorations with staff and existing partners, I can report that there's work underway to deepen and expand programs in and adjacent to the Mayor's Institute on City Design and the Citizens Institute on Rural Design. Uh, we're seeking to bolster our working relationships with regional arts organizations, state arts agencies, and local arts agencies to advance our focus on recovery from the pandemic, as well as inclusion, equity, uh, and connection to underserved populations in rural and urban areas alike, as well as people with disabilities and veterans. We recently released an equity plan in connection to President Biden's executive order from last year. And earlier this month, we had a public listening session to hear feedback about the plan and incorporate feedback into our work going forward. Today, we will consider an equity focused pilot program from, for communities throughout the country to strengthen local arts ecosystems. There's also an emergent work uh, focused on next generation leadership development, likely in collaboration with historically black colleges and universities, tribal colleges, Hispanic serving institutions, and entities with strong ties in rural communities. Today, you will also hear about a new exciting partnership between the NEA and the General Services Administration which will result in new opportunities for the cultural sector and important impacts in communities around the country. So I look forward to continuing to update you on new and expanded initiatives um, over time. So now for some official business, if I can get a motion to approve the minutes of the March 2022nd Council meeting. So moved. Thank you. Second. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any, any opposed? Thank you. At this time, I would like to introduce Ayana Hudson, Act Deputy Chair for Programs and Partnerships, uh, who will take us through the next portion of the meeting. Thank you, yeah. Dr. Jackson. I'm an African-American, middle-aged female. I have long black hair with bangs. 
I'm wearing glasses and red lipstick and a dark blue dress with no sleeves. I use she, her, hers pronouns. And I'm sitting in front of a uh, white background with uh, the NEA logo above my shoulder. We will now proceed with the application review section of the agenda. The tally of the votes will be announced at the end of today's session. The council will be voting today on award recommendations totaling more than $7.2 million in the national initiatives category. These funding recommendations are found in the council book. For your vote to be tallied, you must be present on the line at the time of the motion, discussion, and vote. Council members, you must email your votes to Kim Jefferson, council coordinator, in this category immediately at the conclusion of this part of the meeting. Council members' affiliations are recorded in the council book and later will be attached to your emailed votes. Each member has been provided an opportunity to update this information prior to the meeting. Council members are recorded as not voting on applications with which they are affiliated. This list becomes part of the agency's official record. After a brief summary of the national initiatives category, council members will have an opportunity to ask questions and or discuss the recommendations before voting by ballot. You may I have a motion to consider the recommended grants and rejections in the national initiatives section of the council book? So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. I will now summarize the national initiatives category, pause for any comments or questions from council members, and then ask you to mark your ballots. National initiatives support a wide variety of projects of national and fieldwide significance. And at this meeting, the council's requested to approve funding for five projects totaling more than $7.2 million. Support is requested for the Mayor's Institute on City Design, a program that assists mayors with urban design challenges, promotes design excellence and economic revitalization, and enhances the livability of communities across the country. The Performing Arts Discovery Program, an initiative to introduce international presenters to US performing artists and companies, thereby reducing barriers for American artists to perform overseas. A national services initiative that will support research, information and professional development services for the National Endowment for the Arts, state arts agencies, the six regional arts organizations in cooperation with the agency's state and regional arts education and folk and traditional arts programs. Two NEA research lab grant renewals, which will provide insights about the arts for the benefit of arts and non-art sectors alike, and the NEA pilot equity initiative a new program to further the National Endowment for the Arts commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, and to fulfill the agency's mission to advance equitable opportunities for arts participation and practice. The initiative will expand arts access in historically underserved communities and focus on engagement that builds arts participation among communities with rich and dynamic cultural identities strengthens the organizational capacity of arts and cultural entities, and will include diverse voices among all who participate in and lead this work. Are there any comments or questions from the council? If not, council members, you may now email your votes to Kim Jefferson. And finally, we turn our attention to the projects in the award update section of the council book. These projects have been awarded under the chairman's delegated authority and are brought to the council's attention at this meeting, but no vote is necessary. And included in this section is a list of the FY 2021 American Rescue Plan Act amendments to the FY 2020 Partnership Agreement Awards. Thank you so much. I'll turn it back over to our chair. Thank you, Ayana. I would like now to I would now like to introduce Rod Joy, our chief of staff, who will offer some updates. Rod. Public service is a noble calling and vitally important to a strong democracy. I want to thank all of the members of the National Council on the Arts for their public service. And I want to express my gratitude to the new members of the council for saying yes and for answering President Biden's call to public service. My name is Rod Joy. 
I use he, him pronouns, and I'm proud to serve as the chief of staff for the National Endowment for the Arts. I'm a middle-aged man with dark curly hair. I'm wearing a white button-up shirt and a blue sports coat. I'm sitting in front of a black virtual background with an NEA logo in the upper corner. I'm so, so grateful for the opportunity to be with you here today. A couple of things I'd like to accomplish. Um, I wanna provide a really brief update on the NEA's rescue plan program and some of our recent programmatic accomplishments since the council last met in March. I think we have a slide to accompany a few of these updates. While the economy is bouncing back and the rebuilding work has begun, there's still so much more to do to reverse the damage of COVID-19. We're grateful to the president and to Congress that the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021 included important resources to help arts workers and arts organizations hard hit by COVID-19. This included $135 million for the National Endowment for the Arts. In designing the NEA's rescue plan program, there were two overarching goals. The first was to provide support to arts organizations across the country to help them rehire and reopen. The second goal was to support an equitable recovery by expanding access to funds to communities that have been historically underserved and underrepresented by government. Thanks to the actions by this council and the extraordinary work by the NEA staff team and our partners, we've put ARP to work. I wanna briefly describe the slide that's being projected as I'm speaking now. It provides a high level outline of the implementation of the NEA's rescue plan program. The NEA's rescue plan program or ARP for short, was implemented in three distinct phases or installments. The first column, all the way on the left side of this slide, reflects the first phase of the NEA's ARP program. In April of 2020, 40% of the NEA's 135 million in ARP funding was allocated to 62 state jurisdictional and regional arts organizations for granting to local arts organizations. The center column or second installment of the NEA's rescue plan program reflects an allocation of $20.2 million to 66 local arts, arts agencies in 38 states for subgranting to local artists and arts organizations in their communities. We'll talk more about this major investment at the local level uh, throughout this, this program and gathering today. The third column or third installment of the program appears all the way on the right side of this slide. And this reflects the NEA's direct investments in nonprofit arts and cultural organizations across the country. In January of 2022, uh, the NEA announced $57.8 million to over 560 organizations across the country. Since this council last met in March, Chair Jackson has traveled across the country to see firsthand the impact and ripple effect of the NEA's rescue plan program. Over the last few months, uh, Chair Jackson, as she mentioned, has traveled uh, to places including Oakland, Chicago, Boston, Minneapolis, St. Paul, Baltimore, San Diego, uh, and Reno, Nevada. Arm in arm with state and local partners, uh, Chair Jackson has met with and listened to artists, arts administrative, administrators, creative professionals, policymakers, funders and civic leaders to better understand the economic and social impacts of COVID-19 and the challenges still facing America's artists and arts workers. Almost all of these visits have provided meaningful opportunities to see how ARP investments are being put to work at the state and local level to help theaters, museums, dance companies, symphonies, and other local arts organizations reopen and rehire. Please be on the lookout for more coming soon. Uh, Chair Jackson mentioned upcoming trips planned to Alabama, Alaska, Idaho, Oregon, Maine, and beyond. So our chair may be coming soon to a community near you. As an agency, we'll continue to focus on recovery and improving the health and vitality of the arts and cultural ecosystem in America. We'll also continue to tell the story 
about the NEA's rescue plan program through our reoccurring convenings, blog posts, newsletters, and social media channels. Next slide, please. So the Arts Endowment has been hard at work since our last council meeting on March 24. I wanna thank the entire NEA staff team for their extraordinary service and monumental efforts on grants, partnerships, fellowships, and national initiatives. The NEA is a small agency with a huge mission and we're extraordinarily grateful and proud of all that we've been able to accomplish and plan for these past few months. I'd like to provide a brief description of the slide that's being projected now as I'm speaking. It highlights some of the many activities and announcements uh, since the last council meeting in March. This slide includes several national, national initiatives and uh, one of our fellowship programs. Included on this slide is information about the Musical Theater Songwriting Challenge, which is a competition for high school students who have a passion for writing songs uh, that could be part of a musical production. Uh, we recently uh, announced the winning songs from our latest round of that program. There's information on the NEA Big Read. Uh, the National Endowment for the Arts Big Read is a partnership with Arts Midwest that aims to inspire conversation and discovery through the joy of sharing a good book. The NEA has recently announced the 62 communities that are part of this year's 2022 through 2023 NEA Big Read program. Included on this slide is a visual for Creative Forces. Uh, the Creative Forces NEA Military Arts Healing Network is an initiative of the Arts Endowment in partnership with the Departments of Defense and Veterans Affairs. Uh, this program seeks to improve the health, well being, and quality of life for military and veteran populations exposed to trauma. In partnership with Mid America Arts Alliance, the NEA recently announced the inaugural recipients, recipients of Creative Forces Community Engagement Grants with support for 26 organizations totaling over $750,000. These awards will support community arts programming that will expand the reach and impact of creative forces into more communities nationwide. There's a visual representation on this slide for Blue Star Museums, which is a collaboration between the NEA, Blue Star families, and participating museums across the country. This program is really about saying thank you to military personnel and their family for their service and sacrifice. Chair Jackson recently joined NEA staff to kick off another summer of Blue Star Museums, which is designed to provide free admission to active duty military personnel and their families through Labor Day. Poetry Out Loud. This is the last one, I promise. Um, Poetry Out Loud is a, is a partnership between the NEA the Poetry Foundation and state arts agencies. Poetry Out Loud is a national arts education program that encourages the study of great poetry by offering free educational materials and a dynamic resuscitation competition for high school students across the country. Uh, you're going to experience a, a video presentation on Poetry Out Loud a bit later in today's gathering. All of this and so much more has accomplished since we were last together in March. Uh, during the remainder of this meeting, you're gonna hear more about what the NEA is doing to listen and adapt uh, during this pandemic. You'll also learn more about how the NEA is collaborating with other federal agencies and departments to help build a better and more beautiful America. But first, I think we have a short video clip teed up for you today. Um, I've had the absolute honor and pleasure to travel with Chair Jackson across the country and see her toggle between national and local forums. And her message and vision are definitely uh, resonating at both the hyper local level and on national stages. Uh, Chair Jackson mentioned her uh, recent visit uh, to, May to uh, Reno where she participated in the US Conference of Mayors uh, annual gathering. I think we have a short video clip from her remarks and presentation, which included an open invitation to America's mayors. Thank you all. Mayors, you are visionary leaders with the greatest proximity to the communities we want to see thrive. You set the course for what will happen 
uh, and the ability to do your best work relies on summoning the imagination and creativity necessary to get us unstuck. Uh, the NEA and the cultural sector are your strong allies, and I hope you will see us that way. I'm grateful for the NEA's long connection to the U.S. Conference of Mayors, excited and deeply inspired by what we can do together, and I look forward to working with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Ra. Um, I'd like to introduce now Jen Chang, White House liaison and senior advisor who will report on a new federal partnership, one of many at the National Endowment for the Arts. It's very exciting work that we're very proud of. Jen. Thank you so much, Chair Jackson, and hi, everyone. My name is Jen, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a woman with long dark brown hair and brown eyes. And I'm wearing a sleeveless dress with black and white flowers. I'm sitting in front of a blurred background with the NEA logo in the corner. As many of us gathered here today know well, the arts, culture, and creativity are crucial to our social fabric and our civic infrastructure. They have an active role to play in many other sectors besides the arts community development, public health, education, even physical infrastructure and construction, there is a generative intersection between the arts and other parts of society. The NEA has worked to strengthen and bridge these intersections for a long time, work that Chair Jackson is now bringing fresh perspective and new urgency to. Many of these areas are represented by other federal agencies. The NEA has already partnered with many of them, including the Department of Education, Veterans Affairs, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Department of Defense, and many more. And today I'm excited to share information about a new undertaking with the General Services Administration, better known as GSA. When working with other agencies, the NEA is a voice for the arts within the federal government. We bring expertise and networks within the arts sector to agencies with less arts fluency. There's a steep learning curve when engaging with any new sector, and we can provide strategic advice, connections, and amplification platforms, in addition to much more, to working with other agencies. I like to think about it as something like a translation service or a guide for other agencies as we bridge from one world to the other. A recent example of this kind of partnership was one that we had with the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC and its foundation. We consulted on a grant program called Engaging the Arts to Build Vaccine Confidence, which delivered $2.5 million to organizations using the arts to promote public health outcomes. So partnerships like this can bring attention and dollars to arts communities from much larger agencies than the NEA, and other agencies gain insight and innovation from the arts sector. The GSA is just this kind of agency with current budget resources of more than $47 billion, employing almost 12,000 people. It owns and manages federal real estate across the country. That alone translates to a huge impact on local communities, but it also delivers services across the federal government, including shared technology platforms, global supply chain operations, and real estate management. Earlier this month, the NEA and GSA signed an agreement allowing the agencies to work together to connect new artists to a long-standing opportunity called the Art and Architecture Program. In other words, we're working together at the intersection of the arts and infrastructure. Just a bit more about art, art and architecture. Since the 1970s, GSA has operated this program, which oversees the commissioning of artworks for federal buildings nationwide. Art integrated in this way enhances the civic meaning of federal architecture and showcases the vibrancy of American visual arts. It commissions large scale permanent works for federal buildings. Funding for this artwork is half a percent of the estimated overall construction cost. Since 1972, there have been about 500 commissions for a total of over $67 million. Um, Alexander Calder's iconic painted steel flamingo at the Chicago Federal Center was the first of these commissions. Recently, the GSA has sought to update the program so the commissioned art reflects and better celebrates the full diversity of the country. With our agreement, the NEA and GSA will examine ways to proactively engage underserved communities throughout the process 
with the aim of helping to connect a diverse range of artists to the GSA's National Artist Registry and promoting opportunities to artists and cultural organizations nationwide. It has particular significance right now as the bipartisan infrastructure law will contribute to the construction of dozens of land ports of entry over the next several years, going above and beyond the GSA's annual budget for federal buildings. This will increase the total number of opportunities, and, but it will also open up a wider range of commissions, including some that enable new and emerging artists to access these federal commissions for the first time. We're excited about this new partnership because it reinforces our belief that the arts have a critical role to play throughout society and that when we work together across sectors, across agencies, everyone benefits. We're incredibly grateful to our GSA partners and we look forward to sharing more together soon. So thanks for your time. And now I'm happy to introduce a video from Poetry Out Loud, which is an illustration of the way the NEA brings the joy of the arts to our nation's youth and our communities. Perhaps the world ends here by Joy Harjo. I am a fool to love you by Cornelius Eady. Zakwan Papalotls by Brenda Cardenas. By Walt Whitman. By Sharon Olds. By Francis Ellen Watkins. By Matthew Carter. Arnold. I, as a poet, believe all people need more poetry than they already have in their lives. And so I was very, very excited when I heard about Poetry Out Loud. I myself was in high school when I began my commitment to writing poetry, and I'm glad I did. It changed the course of my life. One of the things I love most about this evening is that the work represented here is diverse and varied and shows the incredible breadth of American poetics. Poetry Out Loud was started by the Poetry Foundation and the National Endowment for the Arts. It is a national arts education program that encourages the study of great poetry by bringing free educational materials to teachers and a dynamic recitation competition to high school students all across the country. Doing Poetry Out Loud was so different than anything else I'd really experienced because the connection that I had made with both this poet and with myself and with the audience, it's given me a chance to look outside of my own bubble. I still struggle with speaking up when I need to, but I know that I can. I have the ability to command a room, and I learned that through this program, that my voice can be heard. The magic of Poetry Out Loud is at the classroom level. Poetry Out Loud hits on all four pillars of our English language arts class. We have reading, writing, speaking, and listening all in the Poetry Out Loud program. So for the person doing the recitation, they're thinking about their pace, volume, articulation, dramatic appropriateness, their gestures, and for the audience, they're consuming great poetry. That's special. I think I have carried a lot of what I've learned and what I experienced through Poetry Out Loud, both in my friendships and my relationship with my family, and even at work, expressing emotionally to other people. It's so exciting to see how much it's grown since our beginnings. We're nationwide, it's reached millions of students, and we're so excited to see how far we can take this program in the future. I believe that poetry is actually at the root of our relationship with creative language and creativity in language. Students who experience poetry out loud, I hope will walk away with this perspective that they can write and do and be all of the things that they are bringing to the stage. Everyone in the audience leaves a Poetry Out Loud event feeling deeply touched, hopeful for humanity, and heartened, and to me that's what poetry does for us. It humanizes us, and teenagers need to know they have that power. Do poetry out loud because it only gives, you know, and being a part of that is so amazing.
Hello, I'm Amy Stoles, Literary Arts Director at the NEA. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a white woman with glasses, brown shoulder length curly hair, and a black top in front of a blurred background with a splash of yellow. A very warm welcome to our National Council and all those tuning in today. The Poetry Out Loud National Finals this year were held virtually on June 5th. And as you might imagine from glimpsing the video, it was an electric evening. We tuned in to hear stirring recitations from nine state finalists who had advanced through classroom, school, state, and regional competitions to the national semifinals, which featured a champion from every state, American Samoa, District of Columbia, Guam, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. And we then waited for the host to announce the winners, complete with an actual drum roll. In third place, Oscar Manuel Lando Samano from Arizona, in second place, Aiden Reed from Colorado, and the 2022 champion Mia Ron from California, who wowed the judges with a poem by singer-songwriter Kara Jackson called The World is About to End and My Grandparents Are in Love. Each competitor recited three poems, and you can hear winning recitations along with many others at the NEA's YouTube channel. Since 2005, Poetry Out Loud has grown to reach more than 4.1 million students and 68,000 teachers from 17,000 schools and organizations nationwide. It has also grown to include a stellar selection of more than 1,200 poems from which students can choose to recite grouped into collections as far ranging as love and war, sorrow and satire. In the last two years though, the number of participating students in schools declined amidst the struggles of online learning. Everyone involved in making the program a success had to face the challenges of the pandemic head on, and they did. Teachers invited poets into their virtual classrooms to inspire the students. Students connected online, creating their own community, and state arts councils held competitions virtually to reach deeper into more remote regions. And these efforts were so successful, they will likely carry forward even when the national finals return to an in-person event. And that's a good thing because poetry combats loneliness, which has become a serious health crisis during the pandemic. We know about the impact of poetry through research from the scientific community and from a study of the Poetry Out Loud program released in 2020, which showed evidence that the program supports students' social emotional development through more avenues of empathy and self-expression and self-confidence and stronger connections with others. In a recent TEDx talk on the takeaways from her Poetry Out Loud experience, Tennessee state champion Kendall Grimes offers a way forward to those who can't see eye to eye. Try to look between the lines, she suggests. Find the meaning behind the words, look for shared experiences, and you'll come to a place of understanding. She is wise beyond her years, like so many of our Poetry Out Loud students, and whether they were drawn to the program because of their love of poetry, or they learned to love poetry and reap its benefits through Poetry Out Loud. Either way, as many of them go on to have careers outside of the arts, they will know poems will always be there to guide them. And now I will turn the mic, as it were, over to my colleague, the inimitable director of theater and musical theater, Greg Reiner. Thank you so much, Amy. And as always, I'm so inspired in hearing about Poetry Out Loud and the work that's happening over in the literature, literary arts division. Uh, I'm Greg Reiner, the director of theater and musical theater here at the National Endowment for the Arts. I'm honored to be able to give this presentation today. I use he, him pronouns. I uh, have dark black hair, olive skin, wearing a gray suit. And I, my background is some theater posters behind me. Um, celebrating some of the wonderful productions that I've been fortunate enough to be part of. Um, so I'm going to talk about what's going on in theater around the country at this moment in time. We'll take you back for a minute to March of 2020, when theaters across the nation closed their doors to live performances for what most assumed would be two to three weeks, a month the most. And at that time, many were able to quickly pivot to digital and virtual performances, while others raced to catch up and build out their own digital infrastructure. And more than two years later now, Thanks to vaccines and intense safety measures, theaters have returned to in-person performances, though recurring waves of outbreaks have caused performance cancellations due to COVID outbreaks in the cast and the hesitancy of audience members to purchase tickets, owing both to the reluctance to make plans that might be canceled and concerns for personal health and safety. 
A recent NEA-funded study from Data Arts at Southern Methodist University indicates that aggregate ticket sales in 2022 are predicted to be less than half of their pre-pandemic high. In conversations with leaders in the field, including a series of regional theater town halls that the NEA theater staff conducted over the last year, and most recently, last week, uh, the first in-person theater communications group conference in two years, which was held in Pittsburgh, an incredible theater town in its own right, uh, a recurring theme is that were it not for the extraordinary federal aid in the last two years, including funds delivered through the NEA in the CARES Act and American Rescue Plan, and via the Small Business Administration's Paycheck Protection Program and Shuttered Venue to Operators Grant, many theaters would not have survived the pandemic. Now that these funding programs have largely concluded, nearly every theater is budgeting for a deficit in the next fiscal year due to lower audience attendance and ticket income, along with increased production costs owing to inflation, supply chain issues, and COVID-related costs such as testing and additional understudies. Several theater directors have described budgeting for the next two to three years as looking at a financial cliff. In other words, the federal aid gave organizations the runway to reopen to get to now and only begin to recover, but we will see the actual impact of the pandemic over the next few years. And it's important to remember that these institutions and cultural, cultural infrastructures took decades to build. If they are lost, we will not get them back anytime soon. Theaters are essential in the rebuilding and healing of our communities, and we have the opportunity now to invest in that process. The pandemic also exposed some underlying existing issues with our field, particularly when it comes to equity and representation, both on stage and behind the scenes. Many have pointed out a silver lining, if there is such a thing, of the extended closures being the time and space to truly tackle these challenges in a meaningful and sustainable way. And as Chair Jackson has stated, we don't want to just snap back to the way things were prior to the pandemic. Or to state in musical theater terms, as Mother and Ragtime sings, we can never go back to before. In a February 2021 article from American Theater Magazine by Indira Eduardo and Penny Leon, these authors remind us that of all the Black theaters forged in the civil rights Black arts movement of the 1960s and 1970s, a staggering 87% had closed by the mid-90s. The Actors' Equity 2020 Diversity and Inclusion Report found that only 10.37% of acting contracts nationwide went to African Americans. Theaters nationwide have responded to the state of affairs, and many funders, including, as you heard, the NEA, have followed suit as well. Here at the NEA, we've redoubled our efforts towards diversity, inclusion, and accessibility and equity, bringing in hundreds of new applicants serving underserved communities through the American Rescue Plan process as part of our work to close that opportunity gap. The efforts to put lives on stage that reflect entire communities that theaters are a part of does have benefits beyond just being the right thing to do. Theaters are seeing an increase in first-time ticket buyers for plays and events that appeal to broader audiences. As one example, Variety reports that at the Brooklyn Academy, Academy of Music, 48% of ticket buyers to their current season were first-time visitors, in contrast to 31% of first-time ticket buyers in the previous season. With programming that ranged from a modern production of Cyrano to a selection of music programming that was curated by poet Hanif Abdurraqib and talks with cultural figures such as Nicole Hannah Jones and Spike Lee. The trick, of course, will be holding on to these new audiences with long term commitments to change and evolution, along with ticket prices that are affordable and accessible. In the midst of all this, we are seeing a generational shift in leadership with more people of color and more women in leadership positions across the nation than ever before in our history. Coming of age in the turbulent post 9-11 years, in leadership and cutting their early career teeth in the fires of the Great Recession, this generation is uniquely suited to meeting this moment, and they are indeed meeting it head on. Looking at their season announcements, following their transformative outreach into their communities, seeing their adoption of innovative digital strategies and programming, I believe if we can survive the financial challenges of the next five years, this generation of leaders and artists really have the potential to lead us into a modern day renaissance of theatrical ideas and innovation, making our communities and our nation incalculably richer. To close uh, in time, to quote the musical Hades Town, spring will come again. Thank you so much for this opportunity and I'm uh, pleased to turn things back over to our chair, Dr. Maria Rosario Jackson. Thank you so much for all those presentations. Um, I hope 
our audience has a window into the varied and important work that the NEA does through all of these programs. There were some really, uh, I think, important observations about uh, adaptation and what we've learned um, through these programs as we move through the pandemic. And I just want to spend just a, just a couple of minutes uh, and make space for any questions or reflections that council or staff may have to offer uh, as you think about what was shared uh, through these program presentations. Anyone? Well, I have a question that has to do with um, sustaining lessons learned or heeding lessons learned from the programs um, that were presented. When you think about um, how that might happen and how we um, actually benefit from that examined experience, and this is a question to, to Greg and to Amy, what do you think is necessary within your respective fields to um, actually benefit from the lessons and not snap back? I mean, I, I can I can jump in. It's I think all of our disciplines are facing that question because as you raised um, Chair Jackson, it's a, it's a new way forward. So it's as, for example, with Poetry Out Loud, as we think about returning to an in-person event for the national finals next year in Washington, DC, we want to return to an in-person event because that in and of itself is an electric time and that the, the students enjoy coming to DC and being together and that in-person experience uh, is hard to beat. But as I also said that, that for example, state arts councils have, did their state and regional competitions, many of them did them remotely to reach in, in other areas. And, and that's a benefit as well. And so moving forward, I think we really have to figure out a way to not replace one uh, avenue with another, but to incorporate multiple avenues. And that takes ingenuity, that takes creativity, that takes more funding in many cases. Um, and, uh, and, but it's possible and that's exciting. Yeah. I'll just say, uh, in, in the spirit of, you know, the, 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 the whole improv game of yes. And I'll yes. And that to say it's gotta be both. Um, we've discovered some really wonderful benefits to the innovation that we've seen in the digital sphere and virtual programming. It's an accessibility issue. People who have mobility issues, can't leave their homes. People who have health issues or concerns and aren't ready to be in a crowded space right now benefit from that and make the conversation richer. Um, there's also, as, as Amy said, the electricity of being in a room with people. And um, as Amy mentioned in her earlier report about the combating loneliness and the idea that we can find ways to gather in community with each other, I think is also super important in this moment. So can I say it's yes and let's let's take what we've learned, let's, but let's also come back together anyway. Thank you. Those are really thoughtful, thoughtful responses. Any other reflections or or questions from council or, or staff? Okay. Well, thank you again. And uh, with that, we can turn back to our uh, official business. And I can tell you that I'm happy to announce that all recommendations for funding have passed. Uh, thank you for your thoughtful participation and leadership. I look forward to our next National Council on the Arts meeting in October, which we hope will be in person in Washington, D.C. And with that, the 207th meeting of the National Council on the Arts is now adjourned. Thank you.